Okay, we're going we're gonna to carry on, okay, looking at uh, the Jesus movement. And, uh, well, let's pray, shall we, and, uh, and, and we'll uh, allow God to speak. Father, we do thank you for the things you're teaching us uh, at this time. And we pray, Lord, that as uh, we look at your word afresh and as we think through uh, the kind of church that you want us to be for the future, we pray that you will speak to us, reveal your plans and purposes uh, for us, uh, and we pray that our hearts might draw closer to you as a result of being here today. Amen. Okay, um, just to remind you, over here, I've put up, uh, so far we've looked at the church, uh, uh, think church, think movement, think church, think grace, all right? And if there's anything else that you think God might be saying, uh, feel free to just scribble on, there's some pens at the side uh, and things like that, so feel free uh, to do that uh, anytime, today or tomorrow. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. In the 16th century, a movement swept across Europe that shook the Catholic Church to the core. The Reformation took place about 500 years ago with Martin Luther as the figurehead for, uh, for the reform of the Catholic Church. And despite being excommunicated by the Pope, the movement attracted uh, many people and uh, the movement gained momentum throughout Europe. A follower of the movement was a young man named John Launder, uh, and he was a tenant farmer from Godston in Surrey. He was born slightly before Henry VIII's break with Rome uh, and uh, the creation of the Church of England, and he grew up as a Protestant. Near the end of October 1554, when he was 25 years old, he went to Brighton uh, on an errand for his father. And uh, by now, Henry VIII was dead. Uh, Edward VI had been on the, on the throne. He'd, he'd come to the throne at the age of, what was it, eight or nine or something like that. Uh, and he too had died. Uh, he'd carried on as a Protestant for the nation. Uh, but then um, uh, he'd died and his half-sister uh, uh, Mary had taken over and come to the throne. And during this visit to Brighton, John Launder attended a prayer meeting at the home of Derek Carver. And uh, at this meeting, the gospel uh, was read. The service was performed in English, and uh, neither of which was permitted by the Catholic authorities who had come to power. You know, it's all that stuff, isn't it, about power and control. The meeting was interrupted by the Sheriff of Sussex, Edward Gage, who arrested Launder and Carver, Carver uh, and others. And following uh, pre preliminary investigations with the Queen's Council, they were sent as prisoners to Newgate in London to await trial before Bishop Bonner. After several months in prison, uh, the investigation found that both Carver and Launder had confessed to taking part in this service as described. And Launder had made a number of statements which actually sealed his fate. He was seen as a heretic in the eyes of the Catholic Church. He claimed that the bread and wine received at Mass did not transform into the body and blood of Christ, but persisted as simply bread and wine as a memorial for Jesus' death. He received the bread and wine only to remember that, Christ's death and passion. He believed that the Mass was celebrated, that was celebrated was an abominable um, uh, thing that they were doing directly against the Word of God. He did not believe that confession needed to be heard by a priest, but that he should confess his sins to God alone. And he said that the, uh, that the priest had no authority to absolve sins. Rather, a man who had sinned should be sorry for his offence before God and no more. On the 23rd of July, 1555, John Launder was brought to Chantry Green in Stenning and uh, there he was burned to death for his beliefs. And uh, there's a memorial there to this day uh, where he was killed. I don't know about you, but I completely agree with what he said. And yet, 
he believed in this movement of the Reformation and he was willing to go to his death with that belief behind him. Well, let's, uh, let's look at uh, uh, our video here again. <laughs> So we're going to go back uh, to the Sea of Galilee again, and we're going to look at this. A movement needs uh, people totally committed to the cause. So tonight, uh, in this talk, let's look at commitment. Uh, we're going to go back to the Sea of Galilee, um, and uh, we're going to go to Matthew 4, 18 to 22. Now, I'll be honest, you might go, hang on, all of this is a bit out of sequence, but the reason why we looked at the miraculous catch uh, after the resurrection was to challenge us to take some risks as a church and do things differently, to not just go along with the model of church that we've kind of uh, got into the swing of and things like that, but to take some risks for the kingdom of God. So that's why I put that as the first, because it kind of sets the stall out for us as a church. <laughs> But now I want to go back to the first calling uh, of the disciples. And again, we're beside uh, the Sea of Galilee. So Matthew chapter 4, uh, verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. You know, if a movement is going to bear fruit, if it's going to be successful, whatever that word success really means, it requires people who are totally committed to the cause of that movement. They need to believe that the movement ultimately is a good thing, something that is good, good for people, good uh, for our nation or whatever it might be, or the right thing that needs to be done. When people follow a movement, they're willing to forgo almost anything and everything. And if they really, really believe it, like John Launder, they will be willing to lay down their lives for it. You know, for the disciples of Jesus, they believed in the ecclesia. They believed in this Jesus movement. And once they'd committed to it, they were willing to lay down their lives. I don't know whether you realize, but all of them died, you know, as martyrs, except for John, who went to the Isle of Patmos, and that's where we were looking at with the, uh, the Revelation reading. 
But all the others lost their lives as a result of following this movement. That's how much they believed in the movement. I wonder how passionate do we feel for the ecclesia, the Jesus movement that we're part of? Do we truly appreciate what Jesus has done for us, what he's won for us? You know, have we truly surrendered our lives to the cause because we really believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? How much do we care for the lost? Or are we all wrapped up in ourselves? When we come to church, is it all about me? I don't like this song, or actually I didn't get anything out of the talk, or whatever it is. I can understand that bit, but, you know... But, you know, is it all about me or is it the cause that we're motivated by? Is that what we feel called to? You know, the first movement that is recorded in the New Testament actually is the movement that took as people left the towns and villages and went out into the wilderness where John the Baptist was baptizing people. Something was going on where people, their hearts were saying, we want to be right with God. We want to come closer to God. It says in Mark 1, 4 to 5, it says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan. You know, the people... There was something going on within them. They wanted to change. They wanted to stop living for themselves. They wanted to return to God. They heard John's call for repentance, and they knew that they really did want to be right with God. And so they were baptized by John in the River Jordan. Of course, it was only a sign of wanting to be made right with God, it was a symbolic act, but it wasn't going to wash away their sins. Because only Jesus can wash away sins, and Jesus at that point hadn't died. But it was a sign that between them and God that they wanted to be right. And then we hear how Jesus goes to be baptized by John, and then he's taken uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the Spirit into the wilderness where he's tempted or tested for 40 days. And actually, that was where the battle really initially was won as Jesus didn't succumb uh, to temptation at the end of those 40 days. You know, when we think about it, we're in a spiritual battle. As a church, we're in a spiritual battle. We're going through hard times at the moment. The devil would love us to fall out with each other. He would love us to pick fault with each other. He'd love us to all have different ideas of where the church should be going for the future and things like this. And he would love to sow doubt, division, confusion, aggression, or whatever it is. We're in a spiritual battle. And we need to be wise to that because the enemy does not want us to be a Jesus movement that changes the world. So then it says, uh, Luke 4, 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. Uh, he was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. You know, people came out for that uh, John the Baptist movement, but now they were being uh, following Jesus at this point, and the crowds started to follow him. And it was whilst Jesus was staying uh, in Capernaum uh, that Jesus came out of the synagogue on, a, on one Sabbath and he was invited to Simon Peter's uh, for some lunch. And Simon Peter, you know, he was a regular guy uh, at, uh, in the synagogue. And uh, he invites Jesus for lunch. And then it turns out that Simon Peter's mother-in-law uh, is at home and she's unwell. And Jesus lays hands on her and heals her. And she's restored uh, and made well again. 
And it says that that night, it says later on, it's Luke 4, 40, it says this, at sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kind of sickness, uh, sicknesses, and he laid hands on each of them and healed them. You know, again, we can read that and just pass over it. But this was actually something very new. You know, if you're a Jew, if you touch somebody who was diseased, you'd become unclean. You don't touch people who are, who are sick. But Jesus broke them old, didn't he? And reached out and touched them. If the person was dying, it was really serious, okay? Because, you know, you really mustn't touch a dead body or any of those things. You'd have to go through all the purification rules and rites and, and things like this. But Jesus reached out and he touched these people. You see, the people thought that if, he, if you touch something that is defiled uh, with sickness or whatever, you'd be defiled. But what Jesus was saying, no, 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 no. My holiness, my righteousness goes on to that person and they are healed. You know, it was completely the other way round. You know, I don't, I don't know whether you, some of you know this, okay. For many years at St. Andrews, I was not a very huggy vicar, all right. I was very kind of would shake hands on the door and say goodbye to people as they were going out. And then... Um, when I, uh, when I had my stroke in Gran Canaria, uh, I, um, I was in this hospital ward in intensive care, wired up to all these machines that were binging and bonging throughout the night. Uh, some of you have told that I, I got to this point where I thought, it's because I'm moving that I'm setting the alarms off. So I'm lying there, like, you know those games where you've got a wire and you mustn't touch the wire with the ring to set the bell off, okay? So I'm lying there absolutely motionless and I'm binging and bonging and I'm waking up other people in, the, in intensive care. And then this nurse came in. She couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak Spanish. And I was, you know, it was in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning. It felt very dark and very lonely. And I just said to her, okay. And she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, okay. But that touch meant everything to me. In the middle of the night, a stranger put her hand on my shoulder and reassured me that everything was okay. And since then, you know, I've become a very huggy kind of person. <laughs> so please forgive me if I hug everybody that moves and things like this. But I realized just how important it is to be touched. You know, some of you uh, help out in the Cornerstone Cafe. You know, there are people who come to the Cornerstone Cafe who live at home, live on their own. They don't come into contact with people. And if somebody just touches them, it's a sign that actually they matter. So I hope that we're going to be a touchy church in future, okay? No pinching bottoms or anything like that, okay? You know, <laughs> you know but, but, you know, we need to acknowledge, actually, that, that, that we, we like each other, that we care about each other, we reassure one another that actually God is with us, that we bless one another. When we pray for people, we lay a hand on people and we pray for God's blessing uh, upon them. So right now, some of you are actually feeling uncomfortable, so let's all stand up. And touch somebody around you appropriately. Okay. <laughs> Okay, 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 that's enough. Uh, put them down. Huggy man. Yes. Open your thumbs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> peace be with you. Yeah, thank you, George. That's it. Uh, yeah. we, we, we remember it now. Yeah. Okay.
Oh, yes. OK, you can have a seat. Have a seat. So, what have I done? So let's carry on. We're going to have a carry on and we're going to look at that calling of the first disciples. You know, Jesus is walking along the side, the side of the Sea of Galilee and he sees two men, Peter and Andrew, and they're fishing and he says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. All right. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Oh, that's the power of touch. That's right. It's the power of touch. Sorry. <laughs> Where's it from? Sistine Chapel. The power of touch. Sorry, I forgot about that. You know, and in a way, when we go and bless people, when we touch them, we're blessing them with God, aren't we, as we, we touch people and show that affection to them. Okay, uh, so it says this, um, that Jesus calls them to uh, come and follow him, and it says at once they left their nets and followed him. And as uh, they see James and John... Uh, who were in their boat preparing their nets with their father Zebedee. And it says this, Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. You know, see, this is what they did. They got the call of Jesus, and they went, see you, Dad, we're out of here. Good luck with the business, all right? I know you're going to plan to pa pass it on to us, okay? But we've met Jesus, and we're out of here, okay? And off they went. Okay, I mean, we've probably all heard sermons about this, haven't we? About how they didn't count the cost and they followed Jesus and they just took him at his word and, and followed him. But if we ask ourselves, who in their right mind would have done that? All right? And, and actually, I think it's quite important that we, we think about this and maybe begin to understand a bit more about it. Now, in Luke's account of this, is quite interesting. It, it sheds a little bit more. Luke was a good storyteller, and he, t he tells a little bit more. You know, the way the story was written there uh, in Matthew is the way that Lynn, my wife, give, tells stories, all right? She goes straight to the punchline, can't be bothered with the preamble or anything like that. <laughs> she goes, oh, life's too short, just there, and, and he followed, and that was it, okay? Me, on the other hand... I like to tell the story, okay? Well, Luke, Luke tells a little bit more uh, to this account. So it says in Luke 5.1, on, uh, one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding all around him, listening to the word of God. Jesus is teaching, the people are crowding him, and they can't, you know, they can't, he, he's got nowhere to stand, they can't uh, hear what he's saying, so he has this great idea. He sees a boat at the side, and he says, um, whose boat is this? Peter says, well, it's my boat. He says, can I uh, use your boat? Just push it out a little bit, okay, and, uh, uh, and, and let me speak to the people. Oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, so he says this. So he says, he got into one of the boats, uh, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked the, uh, him to put it um, out a little bit from the shore, and then he sat down and he began to teach the people. You see, the water caused the voice of Jesus to reflect and bounce off, and it meant that he could speak to more people on the shore. It was a really good idea. It was, instead of, we didn't have any microphones in those days, but it was a way that he could actually speak uh, to the people. Now the crowd control issue was sorted out. It's like he got a moat between him. And, uh, and so he could then teach them. And it says this, verse four, uh, 5, verse 4. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down uh, the nets for a catch. You know, this is something that, you know, they could easily do, except, well, there was a problem. They've already cleared the nets. They've pulled them up. They've dried them up and all those kind of things and put them away. So he says this. Simon says this. Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. 
You know, it's interesting that Luke records him, uh, Peter, saying to Jesus, Master. It's the only place that actually this, this, this happens. And then Peter explains, he says, we fished all night. And Jesus, that's the time you're meant to do your fishing, as I said earlier. You fish at night when the fish come to the surface, during the day, it's a waste of time. They go deep into the water. And, they, you know, uh, just to remind you, I'm the professional fisherman, you're the carpenter, you know. There's no point fishing now. Not only that, you know, we're surrounded by loads of people that I know And if I go fishing and they see me not catch any fish because I'm fishing during the day, I'm going to look like a right idiot. Well, he didn't quite say that, okay. But those are the kind of things that he could have said. But this was a turning point. A significant turning point in the life of Peter. And it says this, But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Doing what Jesus commanded him was probably costly. It might cost him a day's work. You know, he's got to get the nets all dirty again. He's got to labour. You know, he's fished all night. He wants to go and have a lie down. He wants to go and get his sleep, doesn't he? You know, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. See, just think what he didn't know was taking place at that time. didn't know at that moment in time. You know, if these guys, these fishermen, had not followed, if they'd not said what, and done what Jesus had asked, then they would have been faceless fishermen that are never remembered anymore, who resided by the Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago, and nobody ever remembers them. You know, at that time, Peter could not have imagined the journey that he was about to embark on with Jesus. The most amazing journey that anybody could possibly dream of being on. Being with Jesus for three years, seeing all these amazing things, you know, no, but, you know, he, he couldn't have imagined what was at stake. And all Jesus asked him was, put out your nets one more time. You know, Peter couldn't have imagined that one day there would be this place called St. Peter's Basilica in Rome where he would be buried and people would go and follow for years and years and years. I don't have you ever been to Rome? Anybody been to Rome? Okay. And there's a statue of, of St. Peter, isn't there? And he's got this withered foot because everybody keeps going up and kissing it. Okay. And it's like, oh dear, right. Anyway, I'm sure he didn't want any of that. Okay. But anyway. But you know, all Jesus asked, you know, was put your nets over the side. He couldn't have imagined what was at stake. And if he'd said no, that would have changed everyone, everything. Just like Peter, what we do as a church, what we do as individuals, it hangs in the balance. We have no idea what it will mean to follow Jesus. You know, I had no idea that I was going to end up as a vicar in the Church of England. You know, I became a Christian. I've told this story. I came into the kingdom of God kicking and screaming. I was really reluctant to come into the church. And yet, you know, God called me into the church. And I've been odd ever since. (laughs) Okay? And maybe that's why you're all at St Andrews, because you like odd vicars or whatever it is. People were saying to me that over the years you've had lots of odd vicars and one more is... Is okay. What is at stake if we choose to follow Jesus? What might we see as a church if we are completely sold out for this Jesus movement, willing to follow whatever cost it is? 
truly believing. For some of us, I think uh, we've played our Christianity far too safe. We've played it safe. We've looked after ourselves, okay, and actually we've been silent. We've not talked to people about our faith. We felt insecure uh, next to people who are so uh, confident in their not believing that they make us feel kind of very insecure uh, and things like that. But you know, sometimes we just need to take some risks. We just need to say, do you know what? Let me tell you what I believe, okay? And if you don't believe it, it's fine, but let me just tell you. Or maybe let me just share uh, something that I've heard or whatever it is. If Peter had refused to lower his nets, he would have missed out on seeing all those signs and wonders. The healings, witnessing the victory that Jesus had over evil spirits, even seeing dead people raised. He would have missed out on seeing Jesus stand on the boat and calm the storm. You know, he would have missed himself climbing out of the boat and actually walking on water, albeit for just for a few steps. You know, he would have missed out on witnessing the transfiguration and seeing Jesus speak with Elijah and Moses. He would have also missed out on the heartbreak of the cross and the triumph of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And all Jesus asked him to do was put your nets over the boat. And he says, because you say so, I will. And it says this, verse 6 of Luke 5. When they'd done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled to their partners in the boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Mick James, I remember a picture of what your brother gave me of a boat like a little fishing boat, like a trawler, wasn't it? Absolutely full of fish. Okay, I was looking for it to see if I could put it up, but I couldn't get hold of it. But, but, you know, absolutely full of fish. That's what it was like. Their boats began to sink. And Peter, at that moment, said, We are rich! Oh, this is fantastic. Jesus, can you come fishing with us every time? Okay, because this is so good. Okay, this is what we need. We need Jesus. He just attracts fish. Okay, and honestly, we're going to make so much money with Jesus. Every time we go fishing, Jesus, come with... No, he didn't say any of that. It says this, all right? He said, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Jesus, uh, Peter uses, uh, no longer uses the word master, but he changes here and uses the word Lord. It's, it's a moment where he suddenly realized Jesus isn't just a rabbi or whatever it is. He is the rabbi. He is the Messiah. He is uh, the Lord that they've all been longing for. And suddenly he realizes that he's in the presence of great worth, greatness. And Peter is all too aware of his sin. You see, Peter had been taught all his life that God distances himself from sinners. He knew he was a sinner and he, he realized, how can I possibly be in the same boat uh, as Jesus? Because I am not worthy. I am a sinner. He doesn't maybe exactly know who Jesus is yet. Uh, he knows, though, that at this moment, that he's closer to God than he has ever been. And right now, he's aware of, uh, that he's in greatness, in the, in the presence of greatness, and he's aware of his unworthiness. And all the religious people of that day distanced themselves from sinners. Their view was, spend time with sinners, and you'll defile yourself, alienate yourself from God, 
But Jesus came with the Jesus movement to reverse all of that. You know, I could go into a Hindu temple or a mosque or whatever, and I do not get defiled by going into those places. All right? It's almost like folklore or something that, that tells us those kind of things. But actually, you know, I am a child of God. I have the Holy Spirit within me. You know, these things are not going to affect me. If I go into the den of iniquity, somewhere in town, I don't know, a nightclub or something like that, I don't know. <laughs> you know, but if I go to some of these places, you know, we, are we worried that we're going to be defiled? No, we're not going to be defiled. We're going to take light into darkness, aren't we? This is not about separating the two. That is back to the old temple model that we were looking in the last session, you know, and the Jesus movement is about getting stuck in uh, where people are and not uh, allowing ourselves to be uh, separated from the world. It says here in 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 2 verse 15, for we, uh, uh, we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those, uh, and those who are perishing. We're at like an aroma that brings a pleasantness as we get stuck in to the world all around us. You know, little did Peter know that Jesus had come to establish this brand new covenant. It was a, a brand new ethic that Jesus was bringing, this brand new movement that would eventually be called the Ecclesia, the church. It says this, Luke 5, verse 9, it says, For he and his companions were astonished at the catch that they'd taken, uh, and so were James and John and the sons of Zebedee and Simon's partners, and Jesus said to Simon, uh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. You know, this was the calling that was being given to them. Fish for men, fish for people, fish, for, you know, save lost souls. That is the calling that I am giving to you. You know, come and join the, the Jesus movement. And it says this, verse 11. So they pulled, up their, uh, pulled their boats up on the shore and they left everything to follow Jesus. Peter saw a miraculous catch of fish and left everything to follow Jesus. What have you seen? What has he done for you? He hasn't given you a miraculous catch. Actually, what he's given you is salvation. This all is before the, the cross. You know, they followed him and, and believed in that Jesus movement, but now we can look back in the light of the cross and the empty tomb, and we know that actually he has done everything for us. He has given us life, uh, and life in all its abundance. And so when we think about following Jesus, when we think about the invitation to be fishers of men that are given to us, you know, the question is, are we going to do that? Are we going to follow him? Are we going to not count the cost? Are we going to take some risks as we follow him in this Jesus movement? One little step, and we'd have no idea of the consequences, no idea of the lives that could be changed as a result of our obedience to do whatever it is that he asks us to do. You know, Peter actually started off as a fisherman, then he became a disciple of Jesus, then he became an apostle, and then he became an author. Because he wrote a letter. Okay, Peter, I, I, I bet his mum and dad said, you write letter. No, I can't believe, but he writes a letter. And he says this, this is now, after the resurrection has taken place, after the church, the ecclesia has been born. He writes this in 1 Peter 2, 
23, says this. When they hurled insults at him, uh, that's Jesus, uh, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. And by his wounds, we have been healed. You know, when we think about this movement, these people were willing to die for it. Think of another movement just for a moment. In June 1940, uh, France surrendered to Nazi Germany. And it was a terrible blow for the French people to see that their government had let them down, capitulated and surrendered to the Germans. And on the 18th of June 1940, the French president Charles de Gaulle, in exile, addressed the people of France from London. And he called on the French people to continue the fight against the Germans uh, and his message stirred up men and women to form the French resistance movement. And this movement worked underground to disrupt German forces. They attacked rail networks and they were, uh, that were being used by the Germans to transport their weapons and their uh, ammunitions and things like that. They sabotaged German attempts to you know, uh, make attacks and things like that. They uh, supplied Britain uh, and the Allies with intelligence, uh, risking all for the sake of uh, getting that information over to the Allied forces. They hid air crew who had uh, uh, crash-landed in occupied France and found safe passage for them to re return back to the UK. In 1944, it was estimated there were 100,000 members of the French resistance movement. Rather than collaborate with the enemy, they were willing to risk their lives for something they believed in. They knew if they were caught, they were dead. And still they did it because they believed in the cause and they believed uh, in freedom. We need to believe in the calling of Jesus upon our lives we need to believe that the good news really is good news uh, for each and every one of us. And so uh, from, um, after, uh, after the summer till Christmas, we're going to do a sermon series uh, and it, we're going to look at um, <coughs> recapturing the joy of our salvation. You know, we've got to really get hold of what Jesus has done for us. Because if we get hold of it, we cannot be silent. Because it is good news. So when we think church, think church, the word is think risk. You know, if we're going to be church, let's take some risks for the kingdom of God. Think church, think risk. I'm going to drop on somebody now to come and speak to us. Jim Lashwood. Come and speak to us. I'll tell him he's only got two minutes because I know we'll go on for five. All right? Jim, just come and speak to us over here. Why is the gospel good news? <laughs> it's new life. It's new life, isn't it, for us? It transforms every part of our lives. It gives us life eternal. God is with us in everything that we do. It's eternity. It's just it's life itself, isn't it? God is life. And uh, he saved us from our sins. He saves us from an eternal hell, doesn't he? Often we say, what does the word saved mean? But actually, we think, what is life? Is, is, is the call on of the gospel just so that we are comfortable? Is it just that actually uh, we can become good people? Actually, every person on the face of the planet is on a road to hell. That's what the Bible tells us. When we die, we either go to heaven or we either go to hell. And Jesus came to, to proclaim this to us, to say, actually, do you know what? You either take one route. One, the wide is the gate that leads to destruction, he said, and narrow is the gate that leads to life. And he says, I am that life, the way, the truth, and the life. So when we want to go and tell people, it's because our friends, it's because our families, because of us, we're going to be going to hell. 
unless Jesus Christ sets us free and takes us into his arms and brings us into that eternity and our life is infused with him that's what being in Christ means we're not separate from Christ it's when we're brought into him that's why we go to heaven it's because of what he's done I get excited about the gospel the gospel <laughs> is totally it saved us though isn't he Keep going. He's, he's, he, he, he saved us from an eternal hell. If he hadn't come in on my, into my life, I would be going to hell. I would be tormented in hell forever. Yet Jesus came on a cross and took my sin on himself and said, I'll take the punishment so you don't have to take eternal punishment. And he died on the cross for our sins. And he, and he destroyed the power that the devil and sin has on our life. And he set me free. He gave me new life. That's what I mean. It's about having new life, isn't it? And now I'm going to heaven, whatever happens. So that's why all these martyrs and these great apostles, they were like, okay, you might take me out, but then there's someone behind me who's going to tell someone about Jesus. And where I'm going is better. Didn't Paul say something like, he just said, you know, to, to stay is all right, but to go is even better because I'm going to be with Jesus. Bring it on. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just for the record, uh, Jim's an evangelist. <laughs> we might not all be evangelists, all right, but we can take risks for the gospel. We've got to believe that it's good news. We've got to believe that actually if we share this good news and people come to faith in Christ, their life will be better. My life is completely transformed since becoming a Christian. It's not easier, it's harder even, and yet so much more fulfilled, so much more purposeful. And I want to be part of a Jesus movement that brings transformation to the world and lets people see this wonderful good news of Jesus Christ. So when we think church, think Risk. Are we going to take some risks? Just as I come in to finish, I'm going to share. I'm not sure I can read the writing of this, but we'll see. Okay. I'm going to share a little uh, story with you. Janet Stevenson here. Okay. Um, she, uh, she came to Mothering Sunday. Is that right? You came to Mothering Sunday. I'm not asking you to talk. You're all right. Okay. She came to Mothering Sunday. And you know when we had the poses, she took a bunch of poses or flowers uh, for a neighbour in the flats nearby you, yeah? And uh, it, it was a risk. How was that going to go down? I've been to church, it's Mothering Sunday, and I thought I'd bring you these flowers, you know? It's a risk, isn't it? I mean, she probably wasn't going to hit her over the head with it, but he might sort of think she's a bit odd or she's one of those religious nuts or whatever it is. And the lady wrote this card, all right? And it's, it was sent to Janet, and Janet uh, read it out at, her, at our home group, and uh, uh, I asked for the card, okay? And it says this. It says, to Janet, you'll never know how much your kind gesture of a posy of mothering, uh, Mother's Day flowers meant to me. With only one child who does not celebrate this special day, or birthdays, or Christmas, etc. Uh, she's a Jehovah Witness, from what I understand, okay? Uh, and as a, a recent widow myself, Sundays are, not often, uh, uh, are often a day of mourning. Uh, and as, uh, the, um, as the Sunday you knocked on my door, uh, I, I don't even bother getting dressed. You know, and it says, um, and I'll just read, thank you. Um, uh, she gave, gave, did she give you something? She made some cards, okay. And, and I hope you enjoy giving them out to others. This is a lady who is incredibly lonely. Some days she doesn't even get dressed. What's the point? Nobody comes to see me. What's the point of living? Well, actually, let's take a risk and reach out to these people. Let's tell them that life is worth living because Jesus is with us. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that, 
that, that Peter was willing to take that little step and put his net over the boat. And because he obeyed you with that one little step, a whole catalogue of things took place in his life that would never be the same again. And uh, Lord, we pray, help us to be willing to take a step for you. Help us not to play it safe. Help us not to think that being part of the Jesus movement is all about me. But give us a heart for the lost. Give us boldness so that we might take risks in telling people about Jesus and sharing our faith. And let us be completely convicted that Jesus is the very best for all our lives that he gives us purpose and meaning and direction to our lives, that he's made our lives so much fuller and give us a heart for those who are lost. Give us a burden for them, just like you want them to come to faith in you. We pray, give us that same love for them too. In Jesus' name, amen.